Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of KwaZulu Natal, Professor Nana Ogu, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Ioannis Andreas Smith. My name is Ndlandram Kize, the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Humanities. Our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nana Pogu, extends his sincere apologies due to an urgent meeting. He conveys his best wishes. Inaugural lectures form part of the university's public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers. Inaugural lectures present an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and the teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic's career, providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to the rank of full professor. These lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and to present an overview of their own contribution to their field, to academic peers, students, and research collaborators. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his family or friends, mentors and colleagues. Therefore, I would like to acknowledge the following guests who are with us uh, today or who are part and parcel of the university community and the friends of Professor Yanni Smith. Members of the executive management of the University of KwaZulu Natal, members of Senate, our inaugurant this afternoon, Professor Johannes Andreas Smith, family and friends of Professor Smith, academics and professional staff, students, alumni, and in particular, alumni and guests from the United States, United Kingdom, and Botswana, and distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our Dean and Head of School, Professor David Sparrett, who will now formally introduce the inaugurant Professor Johannes Andreas Smith. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Mkise, and good afternoon. It is indeed my honor and pleasure to introduce Yanni Smith. Uh, Professor Johannes A., generally known as Yanni Smith, has been chair of the specialization in religion and social transformation at UKZN since September 2019. He has been a visiting researcher at Utrecht University in the Netherlands and at Leo Beck College in England and at Essen University in Germany and on more than one occasion at Humboldt University in Berlin. He has also been a visiting academic in the United States at the universities of Portland, Oregon, Berkeley, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, the Lutheran University of Chicago, Buffalo and Harvard, and in Africa at the universities of Nairobi, Zimbabwe and Great Zimbabwe. At UKZN, among many other roles, Professor Smith has served as Dean of the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics between 2012 and 2016, and also as an acting Dean in the School of Arts. Smith is the founding editor-in-chief of the accredited, peer-reviewed and open access journal Alternation, an interdisciplinary journal in the study of the arts and humanities, 
That journal was formed in late 1994, and he's been editor-in-chief since then. And he's more recently become editor-in-chief of the peer-reviewed, peer pardon me, Alternation African Scholarship Book Series. Elected as president of the Association for the Study of Religion in Southern Africa in 2013, he refocused the research and collaboration of the association on Southern Africa. From 2014 to 2017, he also served as editor-in-chief of the association's internationally renowned and accredited journal, the Journal for the Study of Religion in Southern Africa. As part of expanding the research agenda and research capacity building in African humanities in Southern Africa, Prof. Smith has led more than 25 research groups in the arts and humanities and supported more than another 50 groups and their networks towards publication outcomes with both national and international publishers. Smith also founded the CHE approved postgraduate religion and social transformation program in 2000, through which he has personally graduated more than 120 students and the program more than 300 to date. He has read numerous research papers nationally, continentally and abroad and published in excess of 70 peer reviewed articles, book chapters and edited books. With effect from May 2020, Prof. Smith is also chair of the Humanities Institute at UKZN, and in September of 2020, he became the regional mentor of the National Institute of the Human and Social Sciences, or NIHSS, doctoral school. Since November 2020, he was also appointed as the NIHS UKZN Research Capacity Development Mentor for Postgraduate Research in the Humanities. It is my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Smith, who will now deliver his inaugural lecture. Um, thanks, colleagues. Honorable Vice-Chancellor and Principal, Uh, colleagues, thank you. Uh, let's start. Honorable Vice Chancellor and Principal Professor Nana Poku, Council and Senate members, Honorable DVC and Head of College Professor Nshlanjlo Mikize, our College Executive Leadership and Administrative Supports, our Dean and Head of School of the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics, Professor David Sparrett, and colleagues and students of our College of Humanities and my school friends and family. In Africa's affirmative ascendant history into openness and also of South Africa as a free and independent nation, it is centrally important to reflect on the thought that informs our transformative development of the humanities, especially the African digital humanities. This talk contributes to this endeavor by engaging aspects of the development of a socially transformative generative grammar or a social phenomenology of thought. It thinks through research, both as to how research informs transformative social thought and how thought processes function during and throughout specific research processes in the African digital humanities. For my presentation, I have drawn on some of my recent published research and also a few public lectures at UKZN on research innovation and my memorial lecture for Professor Bonga Jalagoba, first Vice Chancellor of Durban University of Technology and my former Dean of the Faculty of Theology at the former University of Durban Westfall. It may assist us in our collective and innovative knowledge production in the African digital humanities to reflect on these and similar kinds of uh, matters and issues. Firstly, I am raising a nexus of questions, what I call a nexus of questions, and due to time constraints, I shall only highlight some aspects of this and also only highlight some aspects of my lecture. The first is the question of language or theory in the academy, the question of academic discourse, the referential or representational field in the humanities, in the African humanities, African digital humanities, the question of discursive truth, the question of contextual and reasonable relevance, 
And the question of the problematization of society's problems infra and transstructurally, and then also the question of the episteme. I also raised the question of civilization and the question, obviously, of the African digital humanities. Firstly, then, on language. For the academy's research-led, socially transformed humanities, knowledge production toward constituting a transformed African, Africanized modern symbolic universe, it learns from society as well as intellectualizes socially observed social relations and interactions. These may be in empirical and or in-text social interaction, including the production of materials and artifacts in indigenous languages. It learns from society by studying critical and analytical thought-driven conceptualizations by members in society who engage the social challenges faced by social formations, the exterior forms of the desire to know, exterior to the formal academy from both outside and inside. Secondly, institutionalized language. Concepts specific to disciplines, which are handed on in disciplinary social formations via school or university. Within the specific academic lingua francas of the world, serve to analyze and illuminate data that is regulated within specific disciplinary and subdisciplinary social formations. They serve to inculcate a specific content condition understanding and therefore a mental representation of how the world works and a view of the world in respect of specific social phenomena. Secondly, I share a few definitions of discourse or definitions related to discourse that I have developed in my um, academic work with students. Discourse, to settle and stabilize academic discourse, it has to measure up to the social transformation initiatives and directives for the scientific development of humanities language usage as indicated above. It must be inclusive of constructive analytical thought driven in intellectualization from both in and outside the academy, and especially as these creatively interact it is characterized by open dialogue and captured in practices related to the Lakotla and Indaba, for instance. As practice, its aim is to thematize and conceptualize, develop concepts and themes into discourses and ultimately into constituted and networked discursive formations. I shall not keep you on all these definitions, but I just want to share this one on thematization as a method of, for identifying analyzing, reporting, representing, and interpreting patterns of meaning in data with the help of procedures of analytical and interpretive thematization. And um, you can then uh, at your leisure at some point look at some of these uh, conceptualizations and you can call it definitions. <clears throat> Then our data, things. All potential data for studying the humanities is ubiquitous, pervasive, and permeating life. These things in life can though be studied, depending on how we perceive or construct certain patterns or structures and how they appear in human life and interaction, and also develop time historically. Founders of discursivity organize the human data fields of the world for the human study of the human, whether under rubrics of the arts, religion, philosophy, theology, classics, ethics, the applied human sciences, the social sciences, education, the built environment, and development studies, as in the case of our college. With regard to truth, in the history of thought, those who have dared to know, to study reality as it is in all its dynamics, effects, and prospects, have also always sought to align themselves with the truth devoid of religious, legal, and medical props. In religion, the question of truth has especially been asked about beliefs or dogma, and the truth of scriptures, traditions, experience, and human organization. And even though some semiological answers have been developed and accepted by some, such truth perceived from world historical and world civilizational perspectives are subject to the continuously developing of current world historical and world civilizational discourse and discursive formation developmental processes. Further, for the religions, 
this raises the question of speaking truth. In South Africa, we have had 350 years of speaking truth to various forms of power, which has mostly been ruthlessly repressed through religious, legal, and medical scientific means. The most important has been about pushes for access to knowledge, to which most mission organizations were at the forefront from at least around 1799 to 1953. First, British colonization and imperialism were followed by the ruthless internal colonization of apartheid, which was mostly supported by liberal English economic power with apartheid incisively protecting this through legal and police means. During this period, effectively for 150 plus years, the main system of the societal rationalism of epistemological construction featured the notion of race as a cornerstone. This was deployed and policed through religious, legal, and medical instances. So truth, the touchstone of truth in respect of knowledge, concerns the referential field, what I call the referential field. How the referential field articulates with African realities, past, present, and future, or how this is kept as a central focus of engaged humanities research and founding discussivity development. So truth is not a religion. There are commitments to truth, to African realities, to African internalities, and how the religions of and in Africa articulate with these realities are crucial for our collective material well-being in respect of these epistemologies. Moreover, it is precisely the non-separation of indigeneity from knowledge, but rather the entwined interrelationalities that ensure the empowering effects of knowledge in community and society. Then we look at relevance. Relevance functions in language usage in terms of the assumptions one is able to access in successful communication. An assumption may be related to a word or physical gesture, but also phrases, sentences, and texts as communicated by forms of technology and media. In research, the authoring of a text that reasonably addresses the aspects of a problematization in context is relevant if it achieves agreement from fellow academic peers or interlocutors that the author text is relevant to the problem. The more relevance is achieved with similar conceptual usage in respect of evidence relevant to specific aspects of a problem, there is both a contribution to or a building of and recognition of contextually relevant discussivity in respect of that problem or that problem and similar problems in context in society. Problematization. Problematization is the questioning of the questioning of the nature and function of the chosen human conundrums and social problems, or aspects of a problem that are researched in a specific community or social formation, religious or otherwise. So the questioning of questionings or problematization of problematizations usefully complexifies a social problem and its aspects. From thematizing perspective, such questionings of problematizations may already harbor the contextually relevant themes that may produce contextually relevant text and contextually relevant analysis and interpretation. The aim of thematized problematization is to generate multi-lens crystallizations of the solution-driven analysis and interpretation of complex social phenomena. Optimum problematizations and optimum functioning of the author function works through paradigms, which may be discipline-specific, yes, but especially inter-trans and multidisciplinary due to the ubiquity of contextually relevant data in respect of the specificities of the social phenomenon. A paradigm is a specialized research focus that intellectually problematizes specific social phenomena, methodologically generate data concerning the elements and themes of the problematization and coin or deploy concepts with specified contextually relevant conceptualized vehicles or conceptual metaphors that analyze or interpret the data concerning the specified phenomenon and its aspects in discursive and contextually relevant ways. An episteme is generated when there are forms of coherence in social problematization complexes, their social situatedness, the social systems throughout which they manifest, the referential and rep or representational field and incoherencies in discursive intervention and the nature of the paradigm thought from which these emanate. An episteme achieves epistemic significance beyond specific discursive formations 
or even just founding the specificities when it is regarded as a period-specific approach to the research of social problems and the solution-driven authoring of conceptually relevant scientific texts articulated with specified crystallite lenses of both data generation and data analysis and interpretation. An episteme may include multiple paradigms. So we see that it appears that Thomas Kuhn's notion of paradigm has found a reduced significance in the humanities research uh, approaches, that is compared to his own um, uh, conceptualization. Michel Foucault's notion of episteme is therefore preferred for the broader configuration, which may in fact stretch over centuries. In our context, the escalation of inductive empirical social science research is indicative of the opening up of a space for knowledge emanating from questioning thought interior and exterior to the formal academy for providing a platform that gives voice to the voiceless, to open up opportunities for the full and equal recognition of the equal humanity of all and the production of desubjugated knowledges, local but also universal knowledges. We are living through a period of the exponential increases in empirical social scientific studies all functioning with the primary tool of involving the people in knowledge production with, by, for, and about the people themselves. <clears throat> On civilization, in the past, there might have been many civilizations. Today, there is only one civilization, and that is world civilization. Currently, world civilization is quite problematic in many ways, not least because of the unregulated and uncoordinated global economic processes of development and the growth and advancement of the quality of human life on Earth, irrespective of calamitous environmental impacts for most. This is posing a threat for the future continued existence of Homo sapiens. In view of the calamitous, disastrous impacts it has and continues to have on the biospheres of Earth, there are human environments ranging in Africa from slum through township life to the higher ends of urban suburbs and obviously also our rural areas. So, how the humanities play both interventive and constructive solution-driven roles in respect of specific thematized problematizations, obviously in interdisciplinary ways with the natural sciences, will be crucial for how the current world civilization plans, regulates, and conducts itself in both short-term responsive and longer-term responsible ways. The aim is to reroute onto a new journey, a new global map, from unregulated project trajectories that lead to human environmental destruction to plans and projects of a future world of sustainable self-efficiency and sustainable self and social development. The study of past civilizations are crucial in this respect, especially with regard to their rise and fall, but also the diversity of their optimum functioning. So we may usefully benefit from studying these former civilizations, Egyptian, Sumerian, Greek, Roman, from the Indus Valley, Timbuktu, etc., and also from our civilizations in Southern Africa. It is especially imperative to do this from specifically African conceptually relevant paradigms, insofar as aspects of such knowledge generated may be usefully appropriated in the present, ranging from agriculture and the natural sciences, yes, but also the psychic life and well-being of human beings in all our habitats. So then we turn to the African digital humanities. In late 1990, at one of our two former universities, the University of Durban Westfall, the then departmental head of philosophy, Prof. Marla Singh, suggested I attend the United Nations sponsored conference in New York on the future of education in South Africa in April 1991. I did so. And one of the most important conference resolutions was to establish a committee from expatriates or returning exiles and colleagues in South Africa to develop the hardware and software infrastructure for inter-university computing as well as, as, or as we call it today, digital communication. I served on that committee as from late 1991, representing the arts and humanities for a number of years. And it was this committee amongst others that impacted a number of us to found the journal alternation at UDW in 1994. On this point, the main rationale was that given the fact that computers and computing will become central to academic life and world, with both hardware and software infrastructure being continuously created, what content should run on these systems? The alternation initiative was to generate humanities knowledge contents 
and to do this through interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research knowledge production. We have published on these for more than 25 years and will do much more in future. It is through such research and knowledge production that we are consistently adding content to knowledge production or epistemic construction, if you will. So the African digital humanities is challenged to think further and wider than the regularities of our disciplines so as to produce knowledge content about our African internalities and realities, especially as our indigeneities interface knowledge construction by relevant instances. And the task is for us as researchers to do this with, for, and about the internalities and realities of our own African academic and societal communities, systems, and institutions. So when we raise the, con the, 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 the topic of civilization, we also have to raise the question of the discontent hypothesis, or what I call the discontent hypothesis. The discontent hypothesis, that is the discontent of those who oppose hegemonic symbolic content, where even sense and sensibility are governed by that content is well known. The European authors writing on slavery, female authors and suffragettes, and missionaries and clerical personnel on colonizing frontiers writing in the late 1700s and early 1800s have punctured that hegemonic Western bourgeois cultural content system. Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, as is well known, have wounded it. Anti-colonial resistance and the dawning of freedom in the former colonized world broke its back. Yet, even in our transformative context and culture of learning and authoring, how do we prevent even further exclusion, marginalization, and the developing of systems of thought that desubjugates and not further excludes oppressors and exploits? Firstly, 350 plus years of resistance and struggle culminated in the South African constitution. In the education terrain, we have generated a variety of state apparatuses that serve as instruments for both improving the quality of research teaching and learning and community engagement in terms of relevance, truth, factuality involving communities and sustainable development processes and so forth. I'm talking of the CHE, SACWA, NQF, NRF and our Bill of Human Rights. They all serve such values through reasonable means and processes with sufficient openness for university to create their own systems within uh, set parameters. Secondly, in South Africa, the struggle for freedom was essentially a struggle for human dignity and human rights. Leveraging internationally, it was rights activism that saved the lives of political prisoners, improved conditions in jails, and laid the foundations for freedom and forms of equality and of equity across societal sectors from the 1955 Freedom Charter onwards. These were struggles for radical and grounded transformation of society in terms of values associated with freedom, social equity, and social justice, all serving the fostering of the human dignity of all equally. Thirdly, the main contribution of African civilizations, also the African civilizations of the 20th and 21st centuries, if you will, is that of humanness and human dignity towards civilization. This has been and continues to be a challenging and in fact, a very difficult project in the face of anti-blackism that has been on the rise again during the last five or more years, especially. So this also calls for renewed efforts to study and research and rationally expose the anti-blackisms of history and our present so as to transform them. If the call in Pan-Africanity was that of non-racism in the mid-1990s today, the call for Pan-African contextually relevant knowledge production is for non-anti-blackism a call to which some of our leading scholars across the humanities and their students have already responded and continues to respond. Colleagues, now I turn to a few reflections as somebody who has studied literature for his PhD from writings, firstly, of Bantu Stephen Biko and his notion of the concept of religion. In two of his speeches from 1972 and 1973, Biko reflects on the concept of religion. These are his, the church as seen by a young layman delivered at a conference of black ministers of religion at the Ecumenical Lay Training Center at Edendale. And his chapter, Black Consciousness and the Quest for a True Humanity, written for the book edited by Basil Moore in 1973, titled Black Theology, The South African Voice. 
These two readings have been some of my prescribed readings in one or sometimes two of my annual modules. And interestingly, my personal interaction with Basil Moore led to us publishing his honorary doctoral lecture at Rhodes University delivered at Makanda, then still Grahamstown on 8 April 2011, titled Learning from Black Theology. We published it in the festschrift of our own Professor Martin Brzezewski in June 2018. Denzel Chetty assisted with this project. In his concept of religion, Biko distinguishes three notions. He provides his own generic description of religion. He describes its deformation or corruption or distortion and how we saw it in some forms of South African Christianity. And he describes his notion of black theology as a layman. Much has been researched and written on the wide variety of forms of Christianity in South Africa, so I shall not here discuss Biko's perspectives on this second point, only the first and third, his generic view and his view or perception of black theology. Generically, Biko's take on religion is that all religions are human attempts to relate to a supreme being or force to which he or she ascribes all creation. This fits very well with notions of ultimacy or human focus or primary life orientation markers related to nature and culture that humans have developed for themselves in the religions over the centuries. In addition, though, Biko too raises points on how religion forms moral conscience, serves understandings of a human sense of origin and destiny, the virtual monopoly on truth as presented in virtually all the religions, the ritualistic nature of religions, that they are social institutions trying to explain what cannot be scientifically explained, and that, quote, indeed, each religion has a message for the people amongst which it is operative. On this last point, Biko then discusses the important role religion play, plays in the life of humanity, in relating the present to the future, but also should be playing in the interest of relevance and truth in dealing situationally, interventionistically with poverty, unemployment, overcrowding, lack of schooling, migratory labor, for instance, burning issues in 1972. His main argument on situational relevance, relevance can be made for all religions, making relevant. And that is the challenge for all religions with regard to whichever aspect of the religion you focus on. Similarly, my third point from Biko in his layman address, he then says, Black theology is a situational interpretation of Christianity. In this respect, firstly, black theology is about gaining control of those systems that govern you, so as to govern yourself in church and state. And secondly, the religion must be situationally involved with the people, not remain abstract and removed from people's environmental problems, but physically and materially work for the remo removal of the major sins in society the major causes of actual suffering in specific environments. These critical and constructive perspectives on religion and especially Christian theology is then further worked out in his essay on black consciousness and the quest for a true humanity, which was published a year later. I here only mention three of his most seminal points. That the race problem was developed by the Western capitalist world for purposes of the economic exploitation of black labor and the need for desubjugation from this reality, but also representational system. Secondly, how to tell the truth about the human condition in South Africa, that it is not primarily a class struggle, but the racial one, and against anti-black attitudes in society. And thirdly, that the dialectic that will bring freedom is that of a strong black opposition to the strong white racism that existed at that time, which will then hopefully lead to true humanity. And that is what Biko fought for. Colleagues, the second uh, reflection is on Professor Bongwanjala Gobo and his notion and his take on the concept of religion. Gobo was one of the most eminent of black theologians, a person who substantively contributed to the founding discursivity of black theology in South Africa. One of the most eminent Kairos theologians and my former dean at the Faculty of Theology at the University of Durban Westall. And to note, I also wish to just again convey my appreciation for his leadership to Professor Jairam Reddy, who was the Vice Chancellor and Prof. Gova's line manager, and who graciously attended our memorial event on Prof. Gova's passing. 
For brevity's sake, I just want to make five seminal points about Prof. Goebbels' contribution to the founding discursivity of Black theology and Kairos theology as responses to the secular ideology of apartheid in the 1970s and throughout the difficult years of the 1980s. Firstly, some of his most seminal themes in his research and knowledge production were flagged in 1971 already and then in Article 1980, and then further worked out over the 17 years since 1971, culminating in his PhD study and published as An Agenda for Black Theology, An Agenda for Social Change. And these chapter headings are The Nature of Black Theological Reflection, The Context of Black Theological Reflection, the praxis of black theological reflection, the specific goal and dimension of black theological reflection, a quest for change and towards the theology of the oppressed. Similar to Biko, Goba does not make a distinction between African and black theology, sacred and secular, religious and non-religious and spiritual and material. This allows him to strongly advocate religious pluralism and not regard it as a problem, but as a fundamental fact of religious life. He says, there is an open and dynamic view here that religious identity is something innovative and creative in that it involves a critical re-evaluation of our religious convictions, especially in any context of religious pluralism. African Christian identity, in other words, evolves out of this pluralism in which there is a creative dialogue between the different uh, religious formations and religious worldviews. Thirdly, in black theology, faith in Jesus Christ is characterized by theological reflection on the inclusive and holistic understandings of African life and culture, which in turn leads to the God-given task to challenge racist oppression. Fourthly, that Christian identity is an evolving task, which means it is a praxis, an orthopraxis. He explains that the practice-oriented model of knowledge is a model of truth as transformation. Truth is perceived in the experience of social transformation, where faith is validated by praxis. In the fifth case, fifth point, then that the plight of the oppressed masses and the political tyranny calls for a prophetic theology, a la Kairos theology. This requires confrontational prophetic social analysis of the structural evils of domination and dependence and exploitation and poverty and the focus of these oppressed masses on the future the kind of future that they want, that God wants, uh, Goba says, and how with God's help we are going to secure that future for ourselves. There is much similarity on black consciousness and black theology between Biko and Goba, such as contextuality, relevance, and transformative knowledge production through social analysis in specific situation and context. Yet maybe more than Biko, for Goba, it was important to experience and live his religion, his Christianity, as far as it was for him a theology of the oppressed. For more than 20 years, I have had a significant number of thematizations, conditions in the post-colony that I lectured on and that we studied in undergraduate religion modules and postgraduate religion and social transformation modules. And some of these nine I mentioned there. And then in the decolonizing context, we have responded by thematizing nine issues around which we have been developing founding discursivities. These may contribute to the transformation in material life as founding enabling discursive materialities. Let me conclude. In this brief talk, I have outlined a sample of some of my considerations that have influenced and shaped my own thought in and on the humanities and humanities knowledge production through a recognized instance or means of knowledge production. I've also shared some thought on black consciousness and black theology, which, was both, which were both shaped by two very significant historical figures and their authorial thought in action of founding discursivities. Amongst many, many others, these have also to some degree shaped my own formation as both a literary scholar and ever beginnings of thought, as Edward Said would say. On current and future plans, I'm currently authoring on the existing and potential future discursivities of the topics mentioned in 13, uh, the nine uh, points on the 13 above, as well as those I recently flagged, namely the African bioeconomic, African biosocial and bioethical or biolegal 
in respect of the bioenvironmental and the African biomedical, which I think needs to be rescued from its scientific constructions. Finally, I want to thank all those who have made my life and especially my academic life a lifetime adventure. All academics, friends, teachers, colleagues, students and friends, nationally, continentally and internationally, that have wished to share their lifetime academic endeavors also with me. I mostly thank you. Thank you so much. Professor ladies, and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Professor Nana Poku, members of the executive management, Professor Ntlantlam Kize, the DVC and head of Humanities College, Professor David Spurrett, the dean and the head of the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics, all members uh, of the Hum College of Humanities uh, Executive. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me pleasure uh, to give a vote of thanks on this important day uh, as we celebrate and congratulate uh, Professor Johannes Smith um, in his inaugural lecture. I will begin um, by thanking all those people who have made a difference in the academic career of Professor Johann Smith. Professor Smith would like to thank the following people. Professor Bernard Latekharm of Stellenbosch, who first appointed him as a junior lecturer. Professor Christo Lombard and colleagues at the University of Namibia, where he had his second appointment. Professor Peter Martens, who had him appointed um, at the former University of Deben Westville. Colleagues in the School of Religion and Culture at the former University of Deben Westville. Colleagues in the School of Religion and Theology at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Colleagues in the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics, especially those colleagues in religion. Colleagues who have worked with him on alternation journal, especially Professor Judith Carley, myself, Denzel Chetty, Beverly Van Kansami, Sibongi Senim Somi, and Sizwe Sitole. His students in biblical literature, religion, and religion and social transformation. Colleagues in the College of Humanities and the National Institute um, of the Human and Social Sciences especially Professor Ntlantlamkiz and Professor Poloho Morojele. His late father, Hendrik Jacobus Smith, and late stepfather, Johannes Andres Smith. His mother, Tilly, Katharina Christian, uh, uh, Christina Smith, from Eastern Yezen family, and daughter, Liane Smith. And his wife, Velemian Smith. He says, thank you for all your grace, love, compassion, and care, especially to his wife for the support um, that she has always given him. My name is Nobu Shongwa. I'm the Dean and the Head of School uh, of Arts at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. I do want uh, to thank Professor Smith on behalf of the School of Arts, as well as the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics, where Professor Smith has had the position as the Dean and the head of school. I also want to uh, thank uh, on behalf of the editorial committee, the advisory committee, the international and advisory uh, uh, board for alternation. We're saying congratulations to Professor Smith for this milestone. Thank you very much for, for your great contribution in changing the research um, landscape of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, not only KwaZulu-Natal, but all the tertiary institutions in South Africa and beyond, because alternation goes beyond South Africa. We thank you very much for giving the Humanities Institute visibility at a national level through your work through the NIHSS. 
you have given many of us an opportunity to be guest editors of the Alternation Journal. And for that, we thank you very much. Um, and we congratulate you on this important milestone. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Pra. Uh, thank you to all our guests for attending. And we, we would like to end the webinar now. Thank you so much. Thank you. And congratulations, Yanni. Thank, thank you so much, Pra. Congratulations. Norma. Yes, Pam. Oh, I thought you were going to speak. <laughs> no, I was saying uh, congratulations to uh, Prof. Oh, okay. And uh, have a great weekend, Prof. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Norma. Thank you, Norma. colleagues. Bye now. Thank you, Musa. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Prof Smith. All the best. May God bless you and may you, may you grow from strength to strength. Take care.